So thanks again uh, for the invitation, Jade. It's my pleasure to speak to you all about uh, some historical research I've been doing over the past um, couple of years. And I'm um, going to focus today on some history related to Joggins. Um, and because some of you may not have been to Joggins, um, I guess I want to start the talk. Um, by positioning us there. So Joggins Fossil Cliffs um, is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, yeah, so it has now a, a wonderful interpretive center uh, in the little town of Joggins right on the cliffs there. Amazing um, exhibit gallery display and a uh, place where people can come and learn about the fossils that are found in the in this spot at Joggins. Um, and yeah, so I wanted to, this is going to be a historical talk about this place. And I guess I wanted to start with some modern history. So um, I think the sort of this current era starts with uh, Don Reed opening his Joggins Fossil Center in 1989. So there's uh, Don standing uh, or sitting uh, next to his uh, famous uh, Joggins tree stump. And there was a lot of work uh, from John Calder and Deb Skilleter, who is the curator of the museum here, and Ken Adams at Fundy, and a lot of community members put in the proposal, and Joggins became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2008. Um, and from that time period, there's been an amazing um, group of people that have come about and done work. So uh, Melissa Gray was the curator. Uh, until uh, recently when Jade is now filling that role. Matt Stimson started as a student and he's now an acting uh, geologist with the New Brunswick Museum. And Regan, Regan Maloney is, um, was also started as an interpreter and is now at the Fundy Geological Museum. So just a, an amazing group of people have come about from the Joggins site uh, since it was uh, made in a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2008. And just last year, um, uh, Joggins is now featured at the Royal Ontario Museum, a new exhibit, <laughs> Dawn of Life Gallery. Um, and there is Dawn Reed's uh, tree stump on display. And there's going to be a million people a year seeing that, um, that stump, learning about Joggins and hopefully coming to wanting to come to Nova Scotia. So that's the, the sort of current history. And now I just want to sort of dive back back in time. A lot of this work is uh, informed by work that John Calder's already done. He published a great paper, history of science paper, the Coal Age Galapagos. And I'm going to sort of revisit some of his topics, but also add a few new ones. I'm not going to talk about Williams College visit. That was also published by uh, Falcon Lang in 2009. That's a really great um, uh, bit of history of science, the first um, geology field trip that came to, to Nova Scotia. But I'm going to talk about Lyell and Gesner in, in 1842, a visit by Marsh in 1854, and then a subsequent uh, topics all the way down to stopping at the um, International Geological Congress uh, visiting in 1913. Quick check to make sure everyone can hear me okay. Andrew, give me a thumbs okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, the first published geological map of Nova Scotia. It was produced by um, Charles Jackson and Francis Algier and from Boston. They were um, geologists traveling up into Nova Scotia over a series of three or four years. This is a beautiful uh, map um, that really lays out just the high-end geology um, um, uh, of the, the region. Um, so... This is sort of setting the stage, providing the context and uh, topics. Uh, again, if, if you've not been to Nova Scotia, just want to let you know where, where things are. So Halifax, located on the Atlantic coast, Windsor um, on the southern uh, side of the Minas Basin, uh, Cape Blomidon is also in the Minas Basin, Parsboro and Joggins uh, up there at the top. Another view, another map, another historical map uh, from this one from 1855, and just going to zoom into that Minas Basin area again. Again, showing you those five locations, Halifax, Windsor, Blominen, 
requires Bro and Joggins. So if you wanted to go from Halifax to Windsor, uh, or sorry, Halifax to, to Joggins um, in this time period, you would take the, the road that went from Halifax to Windsor, and you would get on a, a boat and wait for the proper tides, and you would um, take a schooner across the Minas Basin to Parsboro, and then get on your horse or mail car carriage uh, or walk and and take the road to Joggins. So that was the route um, connecting the, these five different spots. So the story starting in 1842 was, was really identified by Dawson as being, Dawson recognized, uh, he wrote the Acadian Geology in, published in 1855, and he starts that by saying 1842 was like a new era for Nova Scotia geology, because this is when Charles Lyell visited Nova Scotia. Uh, both Charles and his wife Mary visited for a month. Um, so Charles Lyell was a really big deal at the time. So he had uh, published the principles of geology uh, in the 1830s, and uh, from that work was invited to tour um, uh, North America, and um, uh, he went to Boston and gave several lectures. So here you see him um, uh, standing there in the, in, with his pointer. And if anyone wonders what PowerPoint is about, so that's his pointer there, pointing to his, his drawings on the, the, the wall. And there's a mastodon, big drawing of a mastodon on the left-hand side. So people would come and hear him talk about these different uh, geological lectures. Um, and um, on his way back, uh, in 1842, he decided to stop in Nova Scotia. So here's the Acadian Recorder newspaper from July 23rd, 1842. And the page three has the list of passengers that have just come in the previous week. And on the end of that second line, you see Mr. and Mrs. Lyell among the passengers from Boston to Halifax. So uh, they actually arrived the week, you know, the Sunday before, um, but uh, it showed up in the paper on the 23rd. Um, we also know about his trip to Nova Scotia because he wrote about it extensively. And this Travels of North America was, was published in 1845. So not only is he coming and doing this research, but he's promoting and telling people about what he's seeing. And, and uh, this is a really significant thing for uh, geotourism as well. So uh, in the second volume, he starts and, and describes how he arrived him and his wife Mary arrived on July 16th um, and then he basically um, tells the story of where they went and what they saw and so coming off the boat in Halifax they then took a quick trip to Point Pleasant Park uh, to see the glacial striations that are visible there um, and this photo is actually from 1873 the oldest photo I've been able to find of the site, but Charles Lyell would have been there uh, and went explicit, explicitly to see those glacial striations. Because um, there was still debate going on about was, uh, was it glacial or was it uh, iceberg drift that was causing these uh, surface geology features. From Halifax, he took that road to Windsor and he met uh, Dr. Harding and they walked along the Bay of Fundy. Uh, and he collected these um, uh, footprints of birds walking in the Bay of Fundy mud, and he carved them out and dried them. Uh, and um, some of these samples are still at University of Edinburgh. So this was really important. He was making observations in the modern world and looking for ways that that interpreted, or how he could interpret the geological or fossil record from what he saw in the modern world. And the Bay of Fundy played an important role in all of that. Um, so from Windsor, he then describes uh, at Wolf Hill, he hired a schooner and headed over the, the bay, Basin of Mines is what it was called at the time. Now we call Basin uh, Minus Basin. Um, so this, is, this wasn't published by Dawson, but this is about the same time. This is uh, 1842 um, from Canadian C Scenery, uh, Volume 2. There's a Cape Blomid and, and Parsbro. So someone... Uh, in a schooner um, from Windsor on their way to Parsboro across the shore there. So there's the, a depiction of Cape Blomidon, a famous mineral collecting site. Um, so he goes on to uh, 
spend many, many pages talking about his trip to Nova Scotia in the travels to North America. And he also uh, published for the first time this figure, uh, 18, that shows the cliffs at South Joggins and near Minuti, Nova Scotia. Um, and he uh, also went on, I just put it in this other page here, he also has this story about how when he was there and, and leaving, uh, he came up to some locals and asked if his friends had already left and gone by. And they said, yeah, they were went by on horseback. And he asked about the origin of the word name Joggins. And, and the, the locals suggested to him it was because the, the shore jogged in and out. So just a little bit of interesting um, insights about what how he's learning about the landscape from the people that he's interacting with uh, in the area. So some new work that I've been doing is I've been really excited to see that um, the University of Edinburgh um, uh, has purchased his uh, notebooks. Um, and I just want to check to make sure my camera shows people on the right hand side. Is, there, is everyone able to see like the full, full picture on the right hand side with the notebook? Someone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these notebooks were purchased, um, uh, 294 notebooks, his field books that he had. And I was just patiently waiting for number 104 to be digitized. And just um, about a month and a half ago, I guess it was, and I just dropped everything and started looking through it. So here's the index uh, from the back of his book after he's written all his notes, he goes through and figures out what's of importance. And it's basically much of his trip to Nova Scotia, who he talked to, what he saw, his little diagrams and notes. So there's still lots of work to do to go through this and really understand the importance of it. But certainly one of the most prominent things that really jumped out at me was on page 48. And you see this um, pencil drawing in the, in the middle and his notes uh, below it, which I'm sure you can't read, but uh, I've gotten used to reading Charles Lyell's reading. So there it is. He says the gypsum scene and a limestone about half half of a mile south of the village of Nudie, the dip carrying the beds under the coal cliffs on the west bank of the Hebert River. So this is his significant observation that he's noting that gypsum are located underneath the beds of the gypsum of the trees, the fossil forest, that the gypsum is older than the fossil forest. And he actually took, uh, there was a disagreement between Lyell and Gesner, who also accompanied him, um, Abraham Gesner accompanied him on this trip. And this was a major source of contention. Gesner really still didn't buy into this. But I also want you to see, so his, his original pencil drawing is in the middle. And then on top of it is a reversed image. The writing is still the way it should be, but he's turned the diagram. Um, the pencil drawing below is basically looking from east to west. And the pen drawing from on the top is looking at it from the water side, but he wasn't on the water. He was, maybe he was like for the low tide, but he's, he's flipped that in pen and drawn in pen later. And that is the actual sketch of what then became published in figure 18 of Travels of North America, this really famous uh, drawing uh, of the first drawing of Joggins uh, fossil cliffs. So this notebook's just uh, a treasure trove of things and still uh, lots of work to do to go through. So uh, moving on to the next uh, important journey to, to Nova Scotia is um, Charles Marsh, who was a famous dinosaur paleontologist at the Peabody Museum, the, the Marsh and Cope Dinosaur Wars. Many people would know that. Very very prolific uh, dinosaur uh, paleontologist. But it turns, uh, as it turns out, when he was in college in 1851 to 55, so he's 20 years old, 24 years old, he was actually more interested in minerals. <clears throat> and he was at uh, Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. And because he was interested in minerals, he actually spent uh, four summers in Nova Scotia collecting minerals. Um, and amazingly, the, um, his two of his diaries, personal diaries, are available at the archives. And I've uh, looked through both of these. So the first one from 1851 doesn't really talk about Nova Scotia. 
But 1854 is just a treasure trove of geological uh, travel knowledge. So uh, just starting off um, uh, sharing some of the, the sort of high level insights from this. So it's the, the journal starts um, on September 1st, 1854. And he says that he's just gotten back the Monday before from a five week vacation in uh, Nova Scotia collecting minerals. And he was very successful. So he spent all of August and part of July in Nova Scotia in 1854. I don't have any description writings of, he hasn't described that in this particular diary, um, um, but he, he does mention that he was there in 54. And I'm gonna try to make that smaller. Um, so then he goes on two weeks later, he says he's purchased Halliburton's Yankee Stories and a couple other books for his school. And he's read several chapters of Halliburton's book, which he enjoyed because he had met Halliburton when he was here and he was familiar with the people and localities that Halliburton refers to in, in those Sam Slick stories. Um, he then later, so then he's gone to school and in the, the next, Summer um, describes in detail his trips to trip to Nova Scotia that summer. Um, so in getting ready to leave Boston, they went down to the harbor um, and getting ready to board the schooner. With the schooner's name was Trial, and the captain was Spencer, Captain Spencer, bound for London, Londonderry. Um, but they were going to be put ashore in Parsboro, um, and the vessel didn't sail. Um, that evening, so they went to see the, you know, this learn these talking canaries or you know performing canary birds, and, and they had a good time waiting for the the um, the fog to lift. The fog eventually did lift. It was a, a few days, but um, they then got on their way. And sort of so August fifth, in his notes, he's talking about on Friday day um, or Saturday morning they. They sailed past Isle Hut and uh, into the Bay of Fundy, and he's been feeling at home. The whole coast, he's he's become very familiar with it, and and is enjoying his trips to uh, the Minas Basin. But he then tells us stories as they came around Cape. They went by Cape Split and saw the riptides. Um, but as they came around Partridge Island shore, and they're getting ready to get off, their baggage was ready. This huge uh, gust of wind came and struck the 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 ship which had its sails all set still and nearly tipped it over he was quite scared that uh, he, he might not survive but at last they they uh, they got the ship turned around and everyone departed and were waving their handkerchiefs and uh, as everyone left so it's really uh, amazing uh, diary of talking about about who he's meeting. Um, he then gets off at Partridge Island and goes up to the Ottawa house where he stayed much of his time there. Um, and he goes on, uh, I wanted to share this uh, entry where he um, has commissioned a mail coach, so the horse-drawn carriage, um, to, to go up to Amherst um, with the family from uh, the Ottawa house. Uh, they're going to, the family and and he are going to attend the bazaar, on the fair that's in Amherst. I've not been able to find any newspaper articles or descriptions of what that fair was like in Amherst. They had a pleasant ride, a good driver. Um, and uh, so he and his friend, William Park, who was also at college, who was also there with him on this trip, uh, left everyone in Amherst and walked to the Cumberland Coal Mines um, and they would meet them at the in Amherst again. So they walked 14 miles through pleasant country, mostly woods, in which mosquitoes and blueberries were very plenty. So you get the idea of what travel was like. They've taken a horse-drawn carriage up to Amherst, and then they walked for 14 miles to get to Joggins. He uh, spent the next day, he and William Park, um, around the mines and on the beach collecting fossils that were in great abundance. Now, you have to remember, he's more of a mineralogist. So this is sort of the first time he's been to Joggins. Now, he's not super interested in fossils. He's more of a, uh, a mineral person. Uh, but they see uh, whole trees embedded in the cliffs, thin bark, limbs, perfectly distinguishable limbs of the trees. And note, he notes that Lyle and Silman uh, had visited the locality before. Um, Mr. Boggs, the agent of the mines, 
help them. And um, uh, Marsh notes that in the evening, they packed up their fossils and left them with bogs to ship back to Boston. And then they walked three miles to Lower Cove um, and eventually met up with the group back in Amherst. So this is uh, significant in that it's describing that he and William Park collected the fossils and left them with Boggs, who then looked after sending them to him in Boston. So we just have to imagine these rocks, you know, wrapped in newspaper in a shipping, you know, a, you know, a shipping box, a, a trunk. Uh, and Mr. Boggs is sort of in charge of it. Um, and why that's significant is um, of the fossils that uh, Marsh apparently collected, uh, he published in 1862 um, a description, and it was a really big deal at the time, of these two vertebrae that he says were found at Joggins, um, and he named them Eosaurus acanianus. So this early reptile, these large vertebrae of an early reptile. Um, and it set off a controversy in terms of uh, later work, then recognizing that these aren't actually from Joggins. They look like ichthyosaur vertebrae, marine rep reptiles more commonly found by um, Mary Anning and everyone on the Lyme Regis coast. Um, so it was during that trip that he apparently found these. And I just, uh, where everyone is trying to figure out, is still trying to figure out um, uh, why he got these confused to be in, in Joggins. Uh, John Calder, um, through a letter he received from Donald Baird and sort of the, the group at Yale, um, their story was that um, Marsh was given the vertebra by the captain who told him that, that he found them at Joggins. But my attention is drawn to Mr. Boggs, this agent of the mines who was in charge of packing up and shipping them to Boston. Um, Boggs may have had some fossils that he thought Marsh would be interested in, and it would be maybe easy to think that they would just be wrapped in paper and put in with the other things and shipped to him. And certainly if, if uh, Marsh had found a vertebra of uh of that significance, you would think he would note it in his diary. So that's been a bit of a mystery. And then uh, another sort of recent discovery I made is uh, at the Yale archives in Marsh's archive at Yale, I found this letter from uh, David Honeyman, who was the first curator of the Nova Scotia Museum, who I've been doing a lot of research on. So this is from 1870, two years after the Nova Scotia Museum was formed. Um, and Honeyman is writing to Marsh and actually asking him if he would send him part of the vertebra of Eosaurus acadianus. And he says, I have no doubt Nova Scotia government will allow me to make exchanges with you if he would do that. As far as I know, there was no reply, um, but really interesting to see this early letter from uh, David Honeyman advocating that he's trying to get these uh, specimens back. And then also doing other historical work here at the museum uh, in Halifax, um, I found these vertebra, which uh, David Honeyman talks about in his writing, uh, and he describes that he purchased these or acquired these when he was in London at the 1862 International Exhibition. So these ichthyosaur vertebra look an awful lot. Uh, now, there, there are notable differences, but they look very similar uh, in general orientation and structure to Eosaurus vertebra. Um, the Eosaurus vertebra, I believe, are still at Yale, so I don't think these are the same thing. But just interesting to note that when David Letterman wrote that letter, he had among his uh, specimens things that he thought were look similar. So uh, that's the story of Marsh and Eosaurus acadianus. The third story is um, of Thomas Weston and sort of the first photographs of the Joggins fossil cliffs. We have the drawing uh, done by Lyle. But in uh, so Thomas Weston worked for the Canadian Geological Survey, um, and he had several trips to Nova Scotia. 
and he writes about them in his memoirs, The Remnants of Among the Rocks, which is a really neat uh, read if anyone is interested in Nova Scotia geology history. And he mentions there that on this trip in 1879, he had been down in Lunenburg Way, he went fishing, and there's this amazing uh, photo of him with this huge tuna. But then he went, was coming back through Halifax. He met with his friend, uh, David Honeyman, who he, he had met three years before at the Centennial Exhibition. And while he was on his way back, he uh, heard uh, from uh, Ottawa and was requested to stop in at Joggins uh, to take photographs to illustrate a pa uh, paper that uh, William Dawson was writing for the Society. So he does that and returns on July 20th. Uh, unfortunately, the Canadian Ge uh, Geological Survey archives doesn't have the photo, uh, but this the photo was the source of this uh, lithograph, which is an early depiction of Coal Mine Point at South Joggins from 1879, and it does say it was from a photograph of Weston. So just uh, blowing that up there, and there is someone standing there, and Weston always did include his uh, uh, local person that would act as his guide. He had them there as a sort of a scale bar. So this is, we're still sort of looking for this original photo, but this lithograph was the, the published version of it. We do have other photographs of Weston that took during that trip in July. So this is from the porch probably of the, the, the mine uh, office. So you see the Joggins, uh, the tree stumps just stack there um, among, the, among the porch. Um, and this depiction of um, the chute going down and uh, down to the dock and uh, a boat there at low tide, uh, the Joggins uh, strata in the background. So these are the first earliest photographs that I've been able to find of the Joggins fossil cliffs. And we'll come back to this photo um, in a little bit. Um, there was other trips um, after Lyle and Marsh um, as things really picked up. Um, uh, and, and MIT geology department actually came several times. So they came in 1879 and 1884 and 1894. And as part of these trips for the students were in charge of writing a detailed log. It was basically their, their project they had to describe what they saw. So these are available in the, in the MIT archives and I've been able to, to look through them. And they're again, really rich sources of who people saw and uh, and also who was on these trips. And it's interesting to think about what careers they might've uh, then had. Um, on the left-hand side here, we also see uh, the sort of the, the third circular tell, describes what people should bring. They should, um, and bring a hat, a flannel shirt, uh, undershirts, um, um, one cake of soap, a woolen blanket, and, you know, all these different things. So um, uh, really neat uh, uh, historical record of what it was like to do a field trip at the time. So um, 1884, um, there's a really well, really great descriptions and some drawings. But 1894 is when it really, uh, that that report is really, really great. Because we also not only have the report, um, we have the newspaper articles of the time that describe who was here and what they were. So MIT is starting to get a reputation for coming to Nova Scotia and exploring the geology. And Joggins was always one of those stops. Uh, and also in that 1894 report, we see these photographs of the students and the faculty at the uh, the rocks at Park, uh, Point Pleasant Park in Halifax, looking at the glacial striations again, Waverly uh, panning for gold. This is 1894. These are, there's about a, uh, 15 or 20 of these photographs of different geology sites all over Nova Scotia. But it also includes Joggin. So there, and this is the head of the mine with a group um, and of the, one of the faculty or students up on the cliff standing doing the proverbial the famous pose with the tree stump and geology hammer in hand so uh, not the oldest photos of joggins but certainly really interesting and and very historic photos of geological visits to nova scotia and that's uh, mit 
So the other sort of level, not uh, not um, university level uh, field trips, but this is now international field trips. So this is uh, this part of the story is about the uh, British Association of Science meeting that was held in Montreal in 1884. It's the first time the British Association of Science held their meeting outside of of the London, UK, and uh, they came to Montreal, but they also um, did an excursion uh, to um, the Atlantic provinces, to Nova Scotia. Um, and that uh, is actually quite well described or, or written up. So here's a new map, uh, different from the 1855. Now you're seeing the railway network um, uh, on the map. Um, this is the map, I think, is from 1887, but basically shows you the time. And from the various reports that we have of this trip, um, uh, a small group of uh, folks um, uh, were met in Amherst, and David Honeyman uh, acted as the sort of the field um, guide. They met on the train in Amherst, then took a, a train down to McCann, and then a horse and buggy ride to Joggins. So that's on September 20th. Um, they then horse and buggy ride back to McCann and a train to Spring Hill Mines where they spent the day um, and uh, then down to Parsboro. So the Spring Hill Mine train down to Parsboro, that was quite a new thing that year. So they were sort of showing that off. Um, they then boarded the ferry uh, at Ottawa House, Partridge Island on Monday and steamed across on Tuesday passing again, um, Blomiden, uh, cliffs at Blomiden, uh, and uh, spending some time in Windsor looking at the uh, gypsum, and then an, a special train down to Halifax, where again, the group saw the famous uh, glacial striations in Halifax. So this trip uh, to uh, that started in Joggins is really well described. Um, um, Honeyman wrote about how who was there, and so it's the president of the geological section of the British Association of Science, Dr. Blandford, um, Mr. Belly from he's a more of a chemist from University College of Oxford, but the premier and the future premier um, are there. Mr. Gilpin, the manager of Spring Hill Mines, a professor from Dow, uh, professor from Amherst, and three reporters and David Honeyman, and so. The three reporters being there and the very political audience of this trip, uh, this this article in the Morning Herald from September 23rd, I just did a word count on it, is 4,000 words long. It's a really amazing description of what they got up to. And the sum of it was some shenanigans. So that remember that photo of the chute going down, there's the description in the story that they were actually, you know, getting on that chute and riding these, these coal chutes down at high speed, some of them, some of them didn't want to do it. Um, and uh, the MIT journals also described getting in these coal chutes and riding these things down. So if Joggins is ever thinking about an experiential tourism thing, maybe a zip line down to the shore and, and recreating this thing, uh, because you know people have been doing it for um, for for a long time, so uh, the the descriptions are really uh, quite amazing. Um, and uh, they're ending their trip at Joggins, and Blanford did collect some fossils. He thought he found something quite significant, but it turned out not to be. But just a just a little snippet from that article. So the journey back to McCann was devoted to the cultivation of musical gifts. So they're just singing in their in the in the cart back and drive back to McCann. And um, David Honeyman, ex premier, and uh, a couple others doing the best of the singing. So a pretty uh, uh, joyous and ruckus time they they seem to have had at Joggins. And uh, so. That's an international um, and uh, you know sort of political field trip. And so the last story I wanted to share um, and some new research bringing to this um, is the International Geological Congress in 1913. So this is a really big deal. This is not just the British Association. This is like geologists from all over the world coming to um, uh, 
in this case, uh, Montreal and, and Ontario, but there was this field trip um, to Eastern Quebec in the Maritime Province, and it's really well described in the field books. The geology is really, really well described, has you know, new geology field maps. Uh, so these are everyone, in, in, you know, major geologists from all over the world are um, are uh, coming to uh, to tour the geology sites of Nova Scotia. Um, and we all have published uh, names of who was there. And I've just highlighted a few that I wanted to, to point out. So a lot of Canadian um, important people. So, um, Walter Bell in Canada, uh, Bear Barrows is you know one of those MIT folks. Jenison uh, is a local churro geologist. He he just had published the, the report on the gypsum. The museum curator at the time, Harry Piers, is there, um, and Charles Schuchert from um, from Yale, uh, who we'll talk about in a second, is also there. And I also highlighted just um, noted that Miss um, Rathjen, so she's the only woman uh, geologist from Germany who came at the time um, was there too. So that's a photo of, of there. So just really interesting group of people that are, are, have come to the area and are touring around. And again, they're largely taking trains to these different locations. They stopped here at at, uh, at Arisag with this photo. Um, and so Charles Schuchert at Yale, his field book, just like, um, Charles Lyell's notebook is in the archives and I've had a digital copy made and, and I've been looking at that. It's really interesting uh, descriptions of what he was seeing. And, and he also was taking his own photos and, and in that field book are the photos that he was given by the Geological Survey of Canada. And this photo is one of those. So it's from around 1890. It's produced by um, the GSC. So sort of like a West End photo. I'm not sure who actually took it, but this photo is then went on to become really important for Nova Scotia because it was the one that was featured on postcards um, through the war years, um, starting in 1911 um, through until um, the end of the Second World War and, and it's being tagged with the land of Evangeline. So the geology photo of Blomid and taken because of its geological features is being co-opted and used as the backdrop for uh, tourism and uh, the branding of Nova Scotia as the land of Evangeline. So exact same photo um, you know, repurposed uh, for many years. So back to the International Geological Congress of uh, 1913. So Charles Schuchert's notes and, and they are quite scratchy in this copy uh, in the PowerPoint isn't super great, but he's basically just talking about the different fossils he's found. So sigillarian trees and calamites and, um, uh, you know, seeing everything in, in, its, in its place. There are some photos that he has of everyone down on the beach and of himself, uh, not at Joggins, but uh, in this case, um, down the shore more towards Parsboro. So these photos of folks on the beach, you know, when they were down there, they were given lunch at low tide. And so these became really, really famous uh, depictions of this trip of the International Geological Congress to, to Joggins. Um, really, some of them really high quality um, and you get to to get a feel of what it was like to be um, among the group, um, traveling around, looking at the rocks, finding the fossils. Um, and yeah, so uh, just sort of um, now thinking about, wanna jump back to the future. And you know, when we see the true success of this dining on the ocean floor at, at Burnt Coat Head um, and you know, booking for next year is $1,500 for, um, uh, for a, a, a couple, this gourmet, really amazing meal uh, at low tide, and and you see where that whole notion really started uh, back in 1913. Um, but uh, the sandwiches were probably a little less uh, uh, flavorful than than what we uh, what you might be able to experience at Burnt Coat Head these years. But again, you see the in 1913 the horse drawn carriage um, and the the cameramen uh, there taking their photos of the group. So that 1913 uh, trip is 
still um, something that we can explore through the notes of Charles Schuchert and others. So, so that's been um, my journey through some of these, uh, or, or summary of some of these historical journeys to Joggins, starting with Lyell in 42 and, and Marsh in 1855, um, the first photos by Weston in 18. 79, uh, the British Association meeting in 1884, uh, MIT through the years, but this really amazing group of photos from 1894 and uh, st stopping with the 1911 or 1913. So uh, 1914, the whole situation changes. First World War basically um, uh, through until the Second World War, Nova Scotia really um, uh, there was not a lot of advances in geology um, or, or visits, so and understandably, but but a really interesting time to think about uh, what role that Joggins had played over the, those years. Um, and so that's all I have to share with you so far, but just wanted to maybe highlight that next year uh, will be the 15th anniversary of UNESCO World Heritage Site at Joggins. So start planning your trip and uh, join the history of these uh, historic journeys to, to Joggins and hope to see you in Nova Scotia next year. And that's all I have.